Casting through Ancient Greece as an Amazon Associate member. As an Amazon Associate, I earn from qualifying purchases. What this has allowed me to do is recommend books to you guys that are relevant to the episode I am presenting. The books I'll be recommending I have read myself and made use of during the writing of the series. If you are interested in purchasing what I recommend, using the link of the book on the episode page of my website will help support the series with providing me a small commission. For this episode, I'm going to recommend The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy by Mike Cole, for obvious reasons. You will have a good idea of what this book is about by the end of this episode. I would also recommend Mike's first title, Legion vs Phalanx. If you head to the interview episode page for The Bronze Lie with Mike Cole on the Casting Through Ancient Greece website, you can find the link for both of Mike Cole's books. Additionally, if you would like to become a member of Audible, the largest collection of audiobooks on the internet, you can click on the Audible banner on the Casting Through Ancient Greece website to gain a 30-day trial membership, where you will also find a number of the books I'll be recommending. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, this time for an interview episode, The Bronze Lie with Mike Cole. I'm taking a short break between our episodes on Sicily, as I have recently had the opportunity to sit down and have a chat with Mike Cole about his latest book, The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy. Mike Cole has had a colourful and varied career, with service in war and crisis response. Mike's writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Daily Beast, the New Republic, and Foreign Policy. He is the author of Legion vs Phalanx, The Epic Struggle for Infantry Supremacy in the Ancient World. Mike is also a popular fantasy and science fiction novelist, with several major imprints. He appeared on CBS's hit TV show Hunted, where he joined a team of elite investigators pursuing fugitives across the southeastern United States, and later starred on Discovery Channel's contact alongside fellow Offspray author Dr. Michael Livingston. And now, Mike has written his second work on history, The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy. The Spartans are one of the most well-known people of ancient Greek times, with most people in modern day times having heard of them in one form or another. Though, we have just about no writing that has come down to us from the Spartans themselves. The picture we get comes from outsiders looking into the Spartan system. We know that they were a secretive society when it came to their inner workings which has undoubtedly led to many anecdotes subscribed to them by ancient writers that have resonated throughout the ages, all the way to our times. To this day, the Spartans are synonymous with a do-or-die attitude and never retreating, doing what's best for Sparta and not the individual. They are praised for their martial attitude, depriving themselves of comforts, to create a tougher society. These, plus a whole host of other tales, have led to what has been coined the Spartan Mirage. What these tales and stereotypes have done over the ages is paint the picture of a tough, faceless warrior society, serving their polis above all. Though, what this has done has deprived us of the human story behind the Spartans, that we find much easier to tease out in relation to the Athenians and other city-states. The Bronze Lie looks to tell this human story of the Spartans by peeling back much of the myths surrounding them. Mike looks through Sparta's military history from their beginnings to show how they were much like other city-states, subject to the same vices and virtues. He isn't looking to defame or berate the Spartans, but rather give them the human face they deserve, rather than the nameless, tough warrior picture that has become all too common. In this talk, I look at Mike's background before his foray into history, and how it would prove to serve him well when writing military history from the human perspective. We then get into his motivations for writing history in general, before looking at what led to him focusing on the Spartans. Mike then explains the bronze lies and the pillars they rest upon, giving us examples where throughout their history we find many of the lies at work. Before we get into the interview, I would like to announce a giveaway courtesy of Osprey Publishing. Osprey has kindly put up a copy of each of Mike's published history books, The Bronze Lie and Legion vs Phalanx, for two lucky Casting Through Ancient Greece listeners. All you need to do to enter for a chance to pick up these two books is make sure you are following Casting Through Ancient Greece on Facebook or Twitter. If you are on Twitter, retweet and like this episode post, or if you are on Facebook, share and like the episode post. Everyone who has done this on either Facebook or Twitter will go into the draw for a chance to pick up Mike's two books, which will be drawn on Friday the 8th of October, two weeks after the episode's release date. I will notify winners by message on the appropriate social media and will post the results. 
Unfortunately, at this time, Osprey can only send out these titles to the US, UK, and Canada. So to be eligible, you need to be in one of these countries also. So spread the word about castings for Ancient Greece and Mike Cole's latest release, The Bronze Lie, to give yourself a chance at picking up a copy. Well, let's get on with the interview. And just a little quick note here, the audio quality does drop off a little as I was recording the interview through Zoom. Anyway, sit back and relax and enjoy the talk with Mike Cole on his latest release, The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy. Uh, hello, Mike. Uh, welcome to the show and I uh, hope you're well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's exciting to be here. That's good. Um, so today we're going to be talking about your latest book, uh, The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy. But um, before we delve into uh, the themes and what you're presenting in that book, I thought um, perhaps you could tell us a bit about your background before you got into writing history. Sure. Uh, so my background, I mean, I'll, I'll try to go through it quickly because it's pretty uh, broad. And it's, uh, I think what's most applicable here is it's the sort of standard military and intelligence and policing career. Uh, there's a lot of us that sort of follow a, a very similar um, career track where I've done uh, intelligence work, uh, mostly in counterterrorism and in um, cyber warfare, including uh, some spins in Iraq. Um, I was also an officer in the United States Coast Guard, a command of the reserve um, at U.S. Station New York. So we would uh, do all of the law enforcement and search and rescue around the island of Manhattan um, and also did natural disaster response. So Hurricane uh, Sandy, Super Superstorm Sandy, which drowned New York, things like that. Also the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, but sort of, and I was five years with the NYPD on a, a defensive uh, computer crime squad. And that's, uh, I, I do similar cyber work in the private sector now. I'm also uh, did some reality TV stuff, which is all investigative. I'm not like real housewives, right? Uh, uh, there's a sector, a sector of sort of docudrama reality TV where um, your expertise is what is showcased, not your awful personality. Um, and I did two investigative shows, uh, one on uh, CBS and one on the Discovery Channel. And then I'm finally, I'm a, a fantasy and science fiction novelist. Um, the Bronze Will is actually my 12th book in my second history book. All the rest are, are novels. And that's actually relevant to my writing of history um, because one of the, I don't know, like, so <clears throat> history is a, it's a big field, right? And there's a lot of people in it. So, and, and pop history, which is the side of the field I find myself on, which is to say that I'm not an academic, right? I don't have a PhD. And I, I want to be clear, I don't denigrate people who have PhDs. There's a lot of um, people in pop history, especially from a prior service military people who deride the ivory tower and, and sort of say, you know, that PhDs are out of touch and that they don't write history that speaks to the people. And I'm, I'm just not interested in that nonsense. Uh, the academy does critical and important work. Uh, they do original research. There's no way that a person like me with just a few years of devoted study to this field can, can compete with someone who's devoted themselves to it full time their entire career. I love the academy and eagerly consume uh, what they produce, but we're doing different things, right? The academy's goal is to do original research and push the boundaries of what we know about the ancient world. My goal is to popularize it. Now, my goal is to serve as a bridge between that original research, which I deeply respect and voraciously consume, but bring it to a wider audience because the truth is, is that academic writing style uh, and the very, um, very narrow, we always say that um, expertise in history means knowing more and more about less and less. Academic history is really laser focused on extremely detailed things that might not um, net the interest of the general public, the people who are playing Rome Total War II, the people who are watching films like 300, like that's the audience I want. And this is a mutually beneficial proposition because if I can get the wider public interested in history and loving it, well, that means greater funding for academics. It means um, more public interest in their work. So I really view myself as a bridge, right? A popularizer of history. Uh, and being a novelist really helps, right? Because it enables you to suss out the dramatic, right? And to, and to see what makes a story gripping and how to portray it in a way that hooks your audience. Now, if you do that irresponsibly, that's bad history. But if you do that while not compromising on scholarship and while holding to the uh, staunchest principles of, of you know, wor of working off of your primary sources, of not making assumptions, of making sure you're um, separating what you're speculating and what you know, um, and, and all of this involves, and also staying up on the consensus in the scholarly community. You know, what are academics saying? What's the latest research? Um, 
really, really critical to do. Add to that then my military background, intelligence background, and policing background. Look, I've been professionally violent my whole life. Um, I have been at arms. Uh, right now, I'm a firefighter, um, which is involved in saving lives, but it's a military environment. It's running into danger. Um, and there's certainly a lot of cultural similarities and universalities that are shared with warfighters. Um, but I also have been a warfighter. In, I've been in war. I've been in combat. Look, a lot of prior service people will say that only prior service military people really understand the military experience. That is nonsense. Um, the military experience belongs to everyone. You being a civilian, I mean, not you personally, but a, a, a civilian, watching a war unfold on television and not fighting it is having a military experience and one that is very valid. But I will say that my perspective as a warfighter, as someone who has been attacked and, and uh, you know, been through that experience, does give me a lens that helps me to narrate experience, um, military issues and experiences um, more faithfully. There's a big movement in writing in many fields now called Own Voices, and it's one I actually have a little trouble with. It's this idea that it's not your story to tell, right? If you're writing about a, a culture or an experience that you're not a part of, that that's some kind of appropriation, that that's not okay. Um, there's a, a lot of, uh, of that perspective, and I don't agree with it. I think that um, you know, people can be empathetic and do the work and understand and, and uh, write about and be involved in other culture, cultures other than their own. But uh, this is not to dismiss that movement's ideas entirely, right? There's certainly some, some validity to the argument. But one of the things I say in the introduction to the Bronze Lie is that the Spartan story is a warrior story. Well, that's my story to tell. Um, and there's this incredible uh, quote from a, a friend of mine, which is that if you don't tell your story, someone else will and they'll get it wrong. <laughs> so uh, I really, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that my, my military experience, I think, helps me flesh out and illuminate what I'm writing about um, in ancient history. So how did I get started writing history? Um, sorry, Mark, you're probably guessing right now that each of my answers to your questions is going to be, you know, some 20 minutes to answer one question. That's fine. You That's can fine. tell I don't Yeah. If, if there's one thing I love, it's the sound of my own voice. So thank you for indulging me. Um, so, you know, I, again, I started out as a science fiction and fantasy novelist. And any nerd who's into science fiction and fantasy loves history because, you know, elves with swords are just a half a step away from Romans with swords, right? Yeah. Um, and I was wargaming. Uh, and I was wargaming Legion versus Phalanx battles um, between the Hellenistic Phalanx. This is, Phalanx is really after the death of Alexander the Great, although it certainly encompasses Alexander the Great and the Roman, the nascent Roman Legion, the Polybian Roman Legion. This is the Roman Legion in the Republic described by Polybius. And it's a really cool, like, dynamic, Batman versus Superman, X-Men versus TIE Fighter. These very, very different formations uh, that come entirely out of different cultural outgrowths fighting each other. Who would win in a fight? It's a really interesting study. So I wanted to read more about it because war games, you know, they, they handle the, the very specific tactical models, but they don't give you the, the larger story. Yep. And I went out to find a book on it, and there wasn't one. I actually, there's a great scholar who all your listeners should find. Uh, he's a, 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 his, a Dutch name, Roel Clinton Dyke. I always mispronounce it. First name, R-O-E-L. Uh, he's currently teaching at Glasgow, I think. But he's really a brilliant uh, ancient warfare scholar and really expanding the boundaries of our field. He had pointed out that there was a book on Legion versus Phalanx Battles, Roel did, written in the 19th century by a German scholar, but I had not found it. Um, and my German is so horrible, it would have took me forever to read it. So I thought, all right, well, I'm going to write this book, um, which is a very, if, as you get to know me, Mike Cole thing to do. And, and then my agent said, well, you know, you don't have a PhD in history. You don't know anything about academic scholarship. No one's going to buy a book from you. And if you meet me and you talk to me for five minutes, you will find out that that is the best way to get me to do something, is tell me that I can't do it. So uh, I went ahead and in a very short order, taught myself enough Latin and Greek to do my own translations. Um, I thought that acquiring ancient languages would be really, really hard, and it was, but it wasn't that hard. Um, and that gave me incredible confidence once I was translating and finding errors in uh, translators' translations. Because remember, you can't, look, the study of ancient history is languages. It's the core of it. Um, and that's really critical. And if you accept the translators' translations, you accept their mistakes. And once I was doing translations, and I don't want to oversell myself, very slow, with the giant LSJ, that's the kind of Greek lexicon next to me, you know, but I was discovering, hey, I wouldn't read this passage this way, I would read it this way. Um, and that gave me tremendous confidence, oh my God, I'm really doing this. And um, that made the project so much more enjoyable uh, to me 
and 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 I just sort of whipped ahead with it. And then of course got the deal with Osprey. And, and probably honestly, only based on my TV fame and my science fiction fame, the promise that I could bring fans from those audiences. I don't think that they believed I was going to write a dynamite book, but I was just sorry, I'm being such a horrible egotist, but I really think Legion versus Phalanx is a great book. Um, I put a lot of love in it. Um, and I think that that love came through. Um, and then I emerged from that experience confident that I could do this. Um, and I was in Legion versus Phalanx, sales were good enough that Osprey came back to me and said, what do you want to do next? And at the time that they asked me that, Trump was on the rise in the United States. Um, and I make no secret of my fist in the air leftism. Yes, I'm part of very conservative circles. I wouldn't call myself part of the extremely woke American left. I find that really um, distasteful. Um, but I'm definitely to the left. Um, and the rise of Trumpism was extremely disturbing to me uh, and remains extremely disturbing to me. We're not out of the woods in the United States, despite having defeated him in the most recent presidential election. And what I noticed was the far right, the Trumpist right, not just here, but around the world, Alliance Nacional in Italy, Generation Identity in France, the Golden Dawn in Greece, the Oath Keepers here in the United States, were using Sparta specifically. And specifically, the vision of Sparta articulated in Zack Snyder's 2006 film 300 uh, which is based on the 1998 Frank Miller comment yep. as a galvanizing principle to look to, to activate the far right to political ends. And I found that very troubling. Then I discovered um, other scholars were already writing about this, most notably Professor Sarah Bond from the University of Iowa, who wrote an amazing article called This Is Not Sparta, which is still available online for free in Adelon magazine, unfortunately now defunct, which, by the way, was founded by um, Donna Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook sister who wrote an incredible uh, book called Not All Dead White Men, which uh, all of your listeners will enjoy on, on ancient history. Um, but this piece on Sparta that Professor Bond wrote, I thought, wow, this is amazing. And basically what she was saying is, you got Sparta wrong, folks. And I thought, I need to hit this from a military angle. Um, and uh, of course, the, the myth is Spartans are badasses, never ran from a fight. If you believe that film 300, right? And I thought, well, heck, we have the sources. Did they ever surrender? Did they ever run? Like, we can literally go find out. There's not a, like a, it's not like we don't know. And has anybody kept score? Like, has anybody made a scorecard, gone through every battle the Spartans fought it, and just kept score? When did they, when did they win? When did they lose? When did they run? When did they surrender? And yeah, I noticed you've, uh, got a, you've got that scorecard in the back of your book as well. So that's very handy. And you can, <laughs> you can just look at it, right? Yep. You can just look at it. Um, and it's, I don't want to swear that no one has done it from an academic perspective, because I think Eugene Ray, who's a, a, a pretty well-known academic scholar, has uh, in the past, but no one had done it from a pop perspective to reach a wide audience yeah. in a book that someone can go into Barnes & Noble and buy um, and not have to pay $250 for Brill or, you know, one of these academics. That's the other problem with academic writing is the highway robbery prices they charge yeah. for the monograph. So um, so I thought, I want to write that. And I... I pitched that idea to Osprey and they said, yeah, man, write it. So sorry, that's the very long-winded answer of how I got from there to here. Yeah, no, it's um, it's interesting. It's uh, very similar to the goals I had where you're trying to reach a, a larger audience, but uh, out of the academic sort of circles. I mean, as you said, both have their their places and the academic circles are, I mean, they're indispensable for us to to get sources and be able to write um, I guess a more popular or accessible history for people to pick up, and like you said, like you know, uh, after wargaming, you you know, you, uh, Phalanx versus um, uh, Legion, you are writing for those people that are playing those games that wouldn't necessarily find those those academic studies on on that sort of stuff around. Whereas right. you can you can popularize it, you can bring your own experience um, from the military to the to the book and and flesh out the examples that you find in in the actual. Um, uh, sources as well and there's separate there's separate skills too you know it's funny i i'm friends with a lot of academics and i keep saying to them just write a popular book you know you'll make money like in, most academics when they're publishing in phoenix or Clio or the journal of american archaeology you know they're not getting paid which is a crime yeah. you know because they're, because they're they're killing themselves and producing original research and it's required for them to hold their tenure and their professor professorships and they deserve money for it and they're not getting it so I keep trying to be like, hey, you know, write a popular book. And I've yet to convince any of my academics friends to do so. And over time, I've kind of stepped back and been like, no, man, like 
what you do, Mark, in, in, in your willingness to do public history, to have your voice and your face be a, a, a commodity for consumption by an audience, right? That takes a, a certain skill, you know, how to speak in public, how to pitch a narrative to a wider audience, and also a personal characteristics in terms of what you're comfortable, you know, because you're your personhood, yourself, is now being consumed, right? People are listening to your voice. Not every academic either has those skills or wants to do those things. Um, yeah. Some do, and some some straddle the fence. Um, but uh, one of the things I've come to accept over time is that they're just different sets of skills. Now, one thing I think both you and I will agree on, and we have to constantly police ourselves, is that we're entertainers, we're working in public, um, and we and, and people are going to trust us, right? We have a wider audience is going to listen to us. You know, in one episode of your podcast, you are going to reach, I'm not exaggerating, 10 to 100 times the number of people that a typical academic article is going to reach, right? So you have and I have a responsibility to approach our subject matter with the same uncompromising commitment to scholarly principles that anyone in a university does. Um, we cannot translate, my book is called The Bronze Lie. We cannot transmit paper lies or audio lies in your case, right? We, and of course we will make mistakes. And of course we will have flaws in our tradecraft and we'll get called out. And when we do, we will be humble and we will accept that criticism because we're here to get it right, not to be right. That's a quote from my friend and mentor, Dr. Michael Livingston whose amazing book, Never Greater Slaughter, I highly recommend your listeners check it out, Late Antiquity, Early Medieval History. But, you know, we have that responsibility, Mark. Like, you know, we're not academics, but in a way we have to do double duty. We, we have to have that same commitment to source interrogation. And, and this is actually something where my intelligence and law enforcement background helps because history at its core is police work, right? It's interrogating and vetting sources. It's it's examining witness testimony. It's gathering evidence and judging it and weighing it and understanding what conclusions you can make and what conclusions you can't. And in, in intelligence, we always talk about statements with high, moderate, or low confidence, right? I, I assert with moderate confidence that the following outcome is likely. You're doing the same thing when you do history. Very, very rarely are you able to come to open and shut conclusions. So it's it's very, very useful. Uh, I was surprised at how useful and translatable those skills are. Yeah. And this is the other thing I found with uh, ancient history was is what drove my, my interest towards it was, I mean, I studied all different time periods, but ancient history, for some reason, I found the lack of sources and evidence that and where you had to go and actually uh, try and assess what is actually happening. You've got tales that are you know woven into mythology you've got all sorts of um, aspects that i don't know to me made it very appealing to try and understand what was happening in the background yeah absolutely well for I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll i'll be give a more embarrassing answer is that um ancient history allows you to be completist which is to say so currently i'm doing a, a, a this will maybe surprise you but my current uh, i have a another ancient project that i'm co hoping to co-author with michael livingston that um is with an agent right now. Assuming that sells, my next book will be in the 17th century AD. Um, so I'm currently working with that. And the there's more sources than I will ever be able to consume. It's just impossible. I cannot read everything and not just read, but really digest everything I need. Uh, there's just too much in too many languages. Um, but in the ancient world, it is extremely possible for you to consume every literary and epigraphical and paleographical source on a particular topic totally and digest it. In many cases, there's only a single source um, for a particular topic. And in my case, you know, your podcast is more generalist, which makes your job harder because you're basically tackling all of the Greek world, right? From a social perspective, from a domestic perspective, from a geopolitical perspective, from a military perspective. I'm focusing on, in Legion versus Phalanx, on heavy infantry battle in the Hellenistic Age period. And in, in the Bronze Lie on strictly Spartan military history, which is bounded from the Bronze Age and really the late Bronze Age uh, all the way up to um, the first century BC, really when Sparta is assumed by Rome. Um, it, it's a pretty limited scope. So it's easier for me to be completist and digest it all. So it felt like for a beginning historian, something I could bite off. It was uh, digestible and small and not too scary and overwhelming. Yeah. But man, let me tell you, now that I'm in the 17th century, woo! 
you know, the printing press has been invented, man. Yep. We, yeah, there's, there's, there's literary sources everywhere. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I guess, yeah, you've got different challenges that, it, that uh, present themselves depending what time period you're looking at. Well, it's just the, the, the later you go, the more so. Well, yeah. I mean, people, dark age historians, and of course, people hate the term dark ages, but dark ages historians will tell you where well, our sources contract in that period. But uh, I would I would have to really look at that to, to know if that's true. But yeah, generally, the later you go, the more you got to work with. Yeah. All right. So um, obviously, with um, the Legion versus Phalanx, it was, I guess, you you were satisfying your knowledge to, to get to grips with what was superior on the battlefield and, and whatever else. And now with um, the Bronze Lie, you're, uh, you're tackling a lot of the misconceptions behind the, the Spartans. And in that book, you outline, I guess, five main sort of um, pillars. But, oh, I guess there's, there's a bunch of stereotypes that are associated to Spartans. So what would you, I mean, what, what are the main sort of stereotypes that would consist in the bronze lie? Uh, wow, so many of them. So the, the big, the central bronze lie that I want to destroy is that the Spartans were the biggest badasses in military history. They were the greatest warriors. They never surrendered. They never ran from a fight. They, uh, you know, they, they trained their whole lives for war. Uh, and that's all they were. They were basically killing machines in service to the Spartan state. And this is just not true at all in any way. And the only way that a person could think that it was true is if they had not read any sources on the Spartans. Now, this is complicated by the fact that the Spartans, like the Gauls, we don't have any writing from them about themselves. Now, pedants will often point out to me that we have some epigraphy. We have some inscriptions in stone uh, that we believe are written by Spartans, the famous ones, and Polamoy in, in war on gravestones, meaning, you know, there's the thought that Spartans only received gravestones who had died in war, and that was all they got. So stone had the name, and and, and Polamoy in, in war. And we do have samples of these that are actually in the Archaeological Museum in Sparta, which I visited in 2019. Um, but we have no literary sources of them describing themselves. And one thing that we can agree with the Kennedys on is that the Spartans, above all else, wanted to be secretive. And they wanted outsiders not to be able to understand them and to plumb their depths. So uh, that seems to be accurate. Well, so what happens? You get a lot of fanboying, right? You get a lot of othering. Um, because any everyone who writes about them is writing about them from a, a remove and a kind of breathless fascination, either negative or positive, mostly positive. But even through that fanboying mess, even through that distance, the record is the record, man. And um, you look at my scorecard and in the center of that book. And all I did, I didn't do anything fancy. This is not particularly original research. All I did was go, went through the sources on the Spartans, you know, from Polybius and Libby and Thucydides and Xenophon and Herodotus and just said, they're all talking about these battles. Did they win? Did they lose? Did they run? Did they, did they surrender? You know, what happened? Did a leader die? And I just went through and made a green tick if they won and a red tick if they did. It's not rocket science. It's not fancy. All I did was write it down. What emerges is an utterly average military record. They were no better than anyone else. They were no worse than anyone else. They have some truly amazing victories and they have some truly ignominious defeats. And what this matches is my lived experience working with the most elite warriors in the United States and British and Australian governments um, when I was in Iraq. Like I was a, a, an intelligence officer and, and a targeting intelligence officer, which is to say that I'm, I'm rolling with these teams, right, to give them tactical intelligence. So I'm up close seeing what they're doing. And what do I see? They are elite. Absolutely, they're elite. They have great heart. They are better trained. They have better equipment. And they are also human beings and they make boneheaded mistakes and they have nervous breakdowns and they get scared and screw up and they go on target and they try to paint the target with a beacon and they friggin' miss and, and they make bad decisions in the heat of the moment that get people hurt. They do everything that regular people do. And there is this need, not just in American culture, but in global culture to lionize military elites and to see in their mythic perfection a solution to our own failures. And this is why when you Google Spartan or you look up Spartan in Amazon, most of the books you see are self-help books. Yeah. They're not history books because there's this deep-seated insecurity that if we just 
improve our diets and work out harder and or engage in more self-denial, this very sort of Catholic medieval <laughs> austerity, that we will be as great as the ancient Spartans that were portrayed in, in Frank Miller's comic and in Zack Snyder's film. Theory. And it's nonsense, Mark. It's nonsense. That's not how human beings work and that's not how life works. Yeah. You know, uh, it is absolutely great. And, and, and the best Spartans, the most heroic Spartans, in my opinion, I have a piece coming out in Smithsonian Magazine next month. It's not Leonidas. Leonidas, this, you know, bronze statue. We know nothing about him. And most of what we know about him is BS. It's real Spartans, like the Spartan general Brasidas, that most people haven't even heard of. The only people who've heard of him, know him from Assassin's Creed the video game, where he's a bit character who's portrayed badly. The thing that's so amazing about Brasidas is that he makes horrible mistakes and gets his ass handed to him uh, early in his career. But instead of <clears throat> having some glorious suicide, like Leonidas is betrayed to have had, he didn't actually commit suicide. He had every expectation he was going to win at Thermopylae. He just lost. Um, Brasidas learns from his mistakes. And if you look at his later campaign in Olynthus in the North, he wins every battle without fighting, without fighting. Yeah. He is winning cities through diplomacy, through treachery, through coercion. Um, and it's very clear that he's learned from his early mistakes where he charged in and got his butt kicked, uh, to me at least. Yep. Um, that is speculation. That story is a human story. And it's a story that's inspirational because I don't know about you, Mark, but I screw up all the time. You know, I, I, I hold a, I, there is no idiot on this planet who can hold a candle, candle to the dumb stuff I've done. And I don't, I'm not interested in bronze statues. I'm interested in people who make mistakes and learn from them and get better. Because then I can look at their example and think, wow, maybe I could do that too. Yeah. And this you is, and, and, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, um, this is the, I guess the big thing I sort of took out of, of your book as well was you're not trying to trash the Spartans and their reputation or, or whatever else. It's, you're showing that they are like any other um, people at any point in time. They've all got their stories. They've all got their, their failings their, and their successes. Um, they're really no different to any other civilization or, or, or city in any point in, in time at all. Yeah, and I just, I, I was telling you before the show, I just, so, I just had to go on Twitter and, and post about this because this is absolutely a leftist revisionist history of Sparta. I fully admit that. You know, my goal here is to take this symbol away from the far right using the truth. But I just told you, I'm not interested in being part of the hyper-woke you know, canceling left. Like that's not, those are not my people either. And I'm not, I don't want this book to be a political weapon for anybody on either side of the equation. I'm a, I freely admit to you, I am a social justice warrior. I am a absolutely committed leftist progressive. But my goal here is to see the Spartans, not to slam the Spartans. Um, and I, and uh, I don't want to replace a bronze lie with a paper one, as I've said to you before. I um, mean, I just had to go on Twitter and make this statement because so many people on the left are taking this book and being like, yeah, you know, that'll show, you know, no, no, that's not what I'm here to do. Um, we have enough division in the world right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, what we need is more reconciliation and dialogue and truth. Absolutely. And to the extent this book can be, and to the extent this book can be a vehicle to that, I'll be incredibly happy. Oh, one thing I wanted to point out. So Petros Dukas, who's the mayor of Sparta and a member of Greece's New Democracy Party, uh, it's sort of, they call it center right. It's Trumpian right. Um, by American standards. When I published a piece in the New Republic, which sort of advanced the points that this book makes, he went ballistic and he went after me in the Greek press. And the tone of his piece was sort of that I hate Sparta. And that's not true at all. It actually, reading his piece broke my heart. It almost brought me to tears because um, you can't do this in-depth study of the Spartans and not fall in love with them. Mm. And here is, a, here is the modern mayor of Sparta hating my guts. And that's the opposite of what I want. And what I want is to, um, I want to tell his people's story, right? Um, but I want to tell their actual story. Yeah. You know, I don't want to tell a myth of, of their story, which is, I guess, what he found so unacceptable. And I mean, and this is the other problem. If, if people were going to read the whole book or are they just going to focus on certain parts? Because I found you go through the book and you read, you know, you, you go through all the history, uh, all the battles and, and what took place based off of what really did happen. But then in the conclusion, you really tie it all together, showing how they are just 
they're like everyone else. They make mistakes, but they also have their successes. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and there are things about them that are very, very troubling to modern people. You know, they were slavers, right? Uh, they did practice infanticide, though not the way that Frank Miller shows them no. practicing infanticide. Um, and one of the things we have a tough time doing in the modern world is we, especially now in this hyper-woke age, is we try to hold ancient, medieval, and early modern people to a 2021 standard, right? The idea of slavery is repugnant to people in 2021, as it should be. And it's a repugnant idea even in the ancient world. But you cannot remove the fifth century BC Spartans from their cultural context. Owning slaves was what you did in the Mediterranean world yep. uh, in, in that period. And it was certainly not unique to Sparta. Caste-based slavery, even the, the halots that they had, that wasn't even unique. The, uh, the penistai was a, the, the slave caste that the Salians held. So I'm not saying that this makes slavery good by any stretch of the imagination. Slavery is repugnant to me and horrifying. But what it does show you is that the Spartans in their slaveholding are no worse than the Athenians or the Thebans or the Thessalians or any other Greek or in, indeed any other Mediterranean culture who all practice slavery on such an epic scale. Um, and infanticide, while a, a certainly incredibly horrifying thing, uh, was much more commonly practiced throughout the ancient world. And we have the archaeological remains to show it. Um, the idea that the Spartans called their sick and weak children because they would not make great warriors is absolute nonsense. And there's no evidence to support that. Indeed, there's evidence countering it. Uh, but the notion that Spartan practices, these repugnant practices, are somehow worse than other ancient Greeks, also not true. So again, like when we look at their averageness, it's their total averageness. They're both averagely good and averagely bad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I thought what we could do now is I'm going to drill down a bit deeper into your, your pillars. I've got them in front of me here, so I'll read them out to you. And I thought what we could do is perhaps just explain what the pillar is is about and then perhaps pick out an example where you you really find this bronze lie at work so yeah i'll read out the first one so the spartans never surrendered and never ran from a fight they always preferred <laughs> death to dishonor and they feared no enemy All right so nonsense uh and the best example uh the most famous example it's the go-to example i use is um the battle of factory in 425 bc so this is a battle fought in a bay, uh, and it's synonymous or corresponding with the Battle of Pylos, which occurs on the shore. But Sphacteria is this tiny little mile long, a little more than a mile long, cigar-shaped island um, off the south. And by the way, it's gorgeous. If any of your listeners ever want a vacation on the southwest coast of Greece, uh, go see Sphacteria. Just bring four-wheel drive, because getting close enough to get to the beach of Pylos and swim across to Sphacteria, the Sikia Channel is only like 100 feet. You, you could practically, you know do three crawls and you're going to be over there. Yep. Uh, and the island is gorgeous. Uh, you, I totally recommend that they do it. Well, so Spart the Spartans put, I think, 420 hoplites, this is their heavy infantry, of whom at least 120 were the elite Spartiati, the, the Spartan citizens, the nobles, on that island to hold it against any Athenian opponents who might wash up on shore. And uh, they got cut off. The Spartan fleet was uh, captured wholesale. And they were starved on the island for about 70 days. Uh, there's only one sort of brackish, smutty spring in the center of the island. So they were having a tough time. Um, and Thucydides really does them justice. Uh, the Cleon and Demosthenes, the Athenian generals, finally decide to storm this position. Uh, and even after 70 plus days, like baking in the sun, this was in the summer, and, and having very thin rations, because the only food they could get was what blockade runners were able to you know, swim over at night, um, they still fought their their guts out. Um, they did real well. Uh, and they were a, a heavy infantry force. Their helots would have probably been slaves, would have done some light infantry work, but they were just swamped by an almost four to one portion of uh, Athenian rowers fighting a silo, these <clears throat> light infantry, you know, with javelins or rocks or slings, and the actual Peltas specialty infantry, um, who were, you know, skirmishers. And they're, they're running in, throwing their missiles, and then running away. And the Spartans, of course, are heavy infantry and can't engage with them because they're too fast. The Spartans did it ectromoi. This, this is Greek for runners out. These are hoplites who are younger and fitter and are meant to run, detach from the phalanx and, and run out and, and fight these skirmishers. But, you know, you're lugging this 22-pound aspis, this heavy shield. And, you know, uh, no matter how fit you are, you're not going to be able to catch up with a, a, a peltast or a silos. Uh, if you're carrying that thing. Um, and so they're slowly taking casualties and getting beaten back. The, the north end of, of Sphacteria is this huge uh, mountain called Mount Elias today. 
and it has a, a sheer cliff to its northern face. So the Spartans, they're, they're going all the way, and by all accounts, they're getting up there, and they're going to fight to the death on top of this mountain. Um, and uh, they have a sheer cliff to their back, so they're not worried about it. And a Mycenaean leader, uh, Coman, um, he had figured out that um, uh, I think those cliffs are scalable. I think I can get around behind them. And this is ironic because the Mycenaeans were people that the Spartans had enslaved early in their history and, and had been made helots. So the fact that this guy was Mycenaean is pretty cool. And the, the Athenian commander's like, yeah, man, if you can do it, go for it. And he, he gets a, a force of light infantry. And sure enough, they're able to scale those cliffs and appear behind the Spartans. Yeah. So now they're, they're sandwiched front and back. Well, if we believe Herodotus's quote that Spartans abide at their post and they're conquer and die, uh, then they would uh, have fought to the death, right? Um, but that of course is not what happened. Can you hear my dog growling in the background? I think she's about to start barking. So I just want to check in with you. Is it coming across the audio? Yeah, it's not too loud though. It's not loud. Okay. So for your listeners, uh, if this makes it into the show, uh, I have a very demanding dog who, uh, when she wants to be pet, will sometimes bark at me. So she's letting me know she's mad that she's not going to get touchy. Um, so uh, um, if she does start actually barking, I'll pause it or something until we can calm her down. So um, the Spartans would have fought to the death, right? If we believe this Herodotus and quote. Uh, and they don't. They surrender. Yep. They surrendered. They realized their position was hopeless and they surrendered. Um, and not only, and you would think if the Spartan culture was like, oh, you know, victory or death, that they would they would be like, the heck with them. They surrendered. Let them die. We don't want them back. But that's not what happened. Sparta fought like mad dogs to get those people back. Why did they do that? Because the Spartans, like anybody else, loved their people. You know, those people were husbands. They were fathers. They were sons. They were part of the Spartan community. And they, uh, you know, they loved them and wanted them back. All right, I'm going to go to another room because uh, I'm concerned about the barking. So That's let me right. go do that. Yep. Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Do you feel like you're stuck in a dinner rut? With HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-measured ingredients with mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip all those trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. You can now enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in 30 minutes or less. With over 25 recipes to choose from each week, there is something for everyone to enjoy. All recipes are designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. Myself, as a father of three, I am really liking the look of the many options under the family-friendly category. Go to the link in the show notes to get $80 off, including free shipping on HelloFresh, the number one meal kit. Have you been enjoying the series and want to show your support in some way? You can visit www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the Support the Series button. Here you will find many ways you can help the series grow, from subscribing, getting involved in social media, and leaving reviews where you listen to your podcasts. Other options also include assisting with my Amazon wishlist for resources and supporting the series on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee. The support I've been receiving so far has been fantastic. So a big thank you to everyone who has been helping me grow the series. So really that's the, the classic example, like these Spartans surrendered. Um, and it, uh, and uh, Thucydides narrates this as, this shocked all of Greece, um, but really did it, if you look at uh, their history of, of surrender and of losing battles leading up to this point, it, it makes it really hard to count. So just, I could give you a, a dozen more examples. That one alone is, is plenty. They yeah. absolutely did surrender all the time. Yeah, um, there's definitely a lot more examples throughout the book to uh, to get stuck yeah. into anyway. Yeah, sure. Um, and just for everyone too, um, Sacteria and Pylos, that happens during the Peloponnesian War. At the moment in the series, we've just come out of the, the Greek and Persian Wars, so we've still got that to come. Um, and right. um, the whole episode of the Peloponnesian War. Um, so your, the second pillar that you've got uh, listed down in the book is the Spartans hated wealth and luxury and refused to use money. Uh, they only ever wore simple clothing and ate simple food. They neither gave nor received bribes. It's just nonsense, utter nonsense. And the, the best example of this is, is that one of the most common ways in which Spartan leaders were 
defiled and, and deposed and kicked out of office was charges of bribery. So uh, Guy Lippis is the general um, who uh, sort of saved Syracuse um, from Athenian uh, siege. Um, and he was run out of town on a rail for bribery. Leo Tychidas, um, who is uh, a Spartan king who is, uh, after the Greco-Persian War, punishing the, the uh, pro-Persian Thessalians um, uh, clan, uh, was found with a sleeve of silver in his tent and run out of town uh, for being bribed. Uh, there is uh, references to uh, the use of Aegean Eden obols uh, as for Spartans to pay their mess dues. Um, that's a coin, you know, it's a gold coin. So uh, some people could make the argument that it's that it's uh, used for weight, um, but, uh, uh, and, and there's plenty of other examples uh, of Spartans. Uh, and, and I'll tell you this, the, the oligantropia, which is the sort of Spartan manpower crisis, where they couldn't have enough, find enough Spartan citizens who so had been through the Ogoge, their sort of brutal upbringing, to serve in the heavy infantry corps in the phalanx. The reason that that crisis came about, and Aristotle says this, is wealth inequality. That to pay your mess dues, to, to, to be a Spartan citizen and to fight in the phalanx, you had to, to stay, keep your status as a homoio up here. You had to be able to pay your very expensive mess dues. Well, if your land couldn't produce enough you know, wealth to pay it, then you would get kicked out. You would become a hypomeo, a, 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 a an inferior. Um, well, how were they? How was this Spartan citizenship decreasing? Right, it was decreasing because wealth was accruing in the hands of the few. And Aristotle points this out very, uh, very clearly. So that fact alone uh, gives this thing the lie. You don't even need to look at the bribes. Yeah, and um, I guess. A very a smaller sort of bribe happened just before Salamis too with um, uh, with Themistocles, right? Um, where right. he offered uh, money to basically have the Spartans or the Peloponnesians stay to, to fight, right? Um, and that was I just brought that up because it's something we covered recently. So yeah, um, I mean it's no, it's a beautiful example. Yeah, but yeah, I, again, like I mean, there's there's many many examples where you just see uh, money changing hands and. and and a lot for personal wealth, not so much for the greater good or, or anything like that. Um, I mean, it's, it's almost never for the greater yeah. good, in fact. Uh, and I also want to remind your listeners that the vast majority of these lies that we're demolishing here, they come from one place, Plutarch, who is writing 500 years after the events he's describing, um, and also writing in a Roman world, uh, and actually arguably a later Roman world. Um, so you got to ask yourself, like, where's he getting this? And what's his motive? And also this, Plutarch wasn't an historian, right? He was a moralist. Mm -hmm. He was writing moral essays intended to improve the character of his audience. Well, that certainly incentivizes him to mythologize the Spartans, doesn't it? So these are the kinds of things. This is what I'm talking about, detective work, interrogating stories. Like, what is the agenda of your witness? Exactly, yeah. And, um, yeah, you normally follow that thread and you can find uh, perhaps a bit more truth than what's actually being presented. Right. right. Um, all right, so our third one is uh, the Spartans held the good of the city-state above the individual. They did not seek individual fame or glory. I guess we kind of touched on that. I mean, it's just nonsense. Uh, and the example I give again and again and again uh, is Lysander, uh, who is um, one of the most famous Spartans and sort of the architect of their victory in the Peloponnesian War, really the Peloponnesian Wars. It's always referred to as one. It's actually three. Um, and he was this incredibly charismatic Spartan who paid people to write poems about him, who uh, allowed the people, citizens of Samos, to have a festival in his honor, the Lysandrea, who uh, installed governments loyal to him personally, not to the Spartan state, so that he could influence their policy uh, after the Peloponnesian War. Uh, there's also the region of Pausanias, who's the, the victory of Plataea, the victor of Plataea, the architect of the victor of Plataea. I actually think he was not um, but he was certainly uh, celebrated as that, who built a monument to himself, honoring himself for the victory. That so embarrassed the government of Sparta that they actually had it altered, his name scratched off, and the names of the contributing city-states put in its place. By the way, this double snake monument is still visible in Istanbul to this day. Um, but yeah, uh, like these are just two easy examples off the top of my head. Of, of people who are interested in their own glory instead of the glory of the city state. And I'm not even trying right now. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Not sure. <laughs> All right. So um, 
The Spartans were the ultimate xenophobes. They hated foreigners, especially the Persians, and kept Greece free from foreign influence and for the Greeks. Just nonsense. Nonsense. Uh, they hated the Persians until they didn't. Uh, in fact, Sparta's ultimate victory in the Peloponnesian Wars, um, uh, the Battle of Vegas Potomac in uh, 405 BC, 404 BC, um, was due, inarguably, to Persian funding and a Persian Navy. Uh, like throughout the entire war, Sparta made common causes. They, they campaigned against them again under Gesalaus II. But Persia's influence on Spartan policy and their money uh, in particular were a huge part of, uh, uh, of Spartan policy. And Sparta very happily walked away from the freedom of the Greeks on the Ionian coast in, in the west portion of Persia in, in exchange for Persian support uh, and, and Persian, peace, Persian brokered peace deals. So it's just nonsense. Sparta, like any other country, was self-interested. And when Persia was aligned with their interests, they made common cause with them. And when Persia was opposed to their interests, they fought against them. And again, the only way to believe that is to ignore the sources. Yeah, and, and this is the, the whole point of the book is, is showing that it's down to the, the circumstance of the time. I mean, at one right. point, yeah, um, hating the Persians and trying to unite to fight against them will suit certain purposes at that time. But then 50 years later, circumstances change. You've got whole new generations, right. new leadership, uh, new world structure. You know, it's it's just like today, you know, it's depends on the, the interests of the nation um, of, of the time at the time of the Well, I mean, look at a great example, corollaries, the United States. You know, I came up in a, in a generation where opposing Russia was a matter of national policy. And then Trump becomes president. And all of a sudden, we're aligned with Russia and making common cause with Russia. Um, and a lot of people in America are very horrified by that. And I certainly was too. But the but the reality of it is, is that's that's politics, man. Like that's that's there's more history of that than of anything else. So I, you know, I'm sort of not surprised by it all. And now with the new administration, we're against Russia again. So um, it's very very common to see that uh, flip flopping uh, in policy. Mm. And I think that's where. You especially with us looking back so far, you can take one general point in, in Spartan history and then that gets portrayed as the norm, but it's it's only relevant for that one point of time. And then things, history, things history change. History is organic. Yes. Yeah, history is organic. People evolve. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I, uh, I told you I, I'm, I'm looking into the 17th century now. And, uh, you know, you look at the English Civil War and I, I, I was on a, I'm part of an English Civil War group online on Facebook and someone asked the question about uniforms in the English Civil War and I'm like well what civil war are you talking about because it, the what the what uniforms look like in 1642 is not what uniforms look like in 1650 right and the same thing is true a oh, perfect example one of the uh, most common images you'll see of Spartans is the fully armored Spartans so cuirass greaves aspis shield full face Corinthian helmet right uh, and usually that aspis shield is anachronistically painted with the Spartan lambda, like on that shield behind you. Yep. Which, of course, we only have one. We only have one tiny shred of evidence that that ever happened. And if it did happen, it happened way later, when Spartans didn't look like that. So if you go into the middle of the Peloponnesian War, then then Spartans are wearing no arm at all. And if they have a helmet, it's a little pelos helmet, which is a like a bronze cap that leaves the face totally exposed. And they're wearing no body armor and no leg armor. Yep. They're basically fighting in clothes with a big shield. Uh, but of course, that impression of the Spartan is never portrayed in popular art, right? Because that's it looks kind of dumb. You know, it's a half naked guy in like a what looks like a toga, you know, with a big shield and and a, and, a, and a spear, and that's it. It's not as cool as the fully armored Spartan, so uh, uh, you don't see it portrayed. So yeah, even that question of what does a Spartan at war look like? Well, it depends on when you ask. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. There's no set point. You've got to you've got to judge every period in its own right. Right. Um, all right. So the last point you make, the last pillar you have, is uh, the Spartans loved liberty and opposed tyranny. <laughs> nope. Sorry. Uh, you know, they got a reputation for unseating tyrants, and they did. Um, uh, you know, most famous, I think, is their uh, uh, campaign against Polycrates of Samos, um, which, by the way, didn't work out for them. And was one of the best examples of, of, of the conclusion I make in the book, which is that the Spartans sucked at siege warfare. <laughs> um but the truth is that Spartans opposed tyrants when it suited Sparta's 
policy objectives. And when it suited Sparta's policy objectives to install tyrants, they did the same thing. Uh, and a great example of this is the democracy at Athens, um, which Cleomenes I attempted to overthrow because it was contrary to Sparta's uh, political interests. And what did they try to replace this democracy with was a tyrant who is sympathetic to Sparta's goals. And in fact, an Athenian popular uprising is what put paid to that and, and, and drove the Spartans from the city. These Spartans who never surrendered were chased out of Athens by a mob, not even an army. Yep. Um, so like, it's just, again, this is what's so frustrating about these lies is that they're so universally believed. And, you know, you look at people, you know, why are you doing the Spartan run? You know, why are you reading this book on Spartan fitness, this guide to Spartan fitness? And they would say, well, the Spartans were the greatest warriors ever. And they would repeat all these lies that you're saying. Um, and I'll always think, have you read a single source? Have you read Xenophon? Have you read Thucydides? And I understand that it's a tall order uh, to ask most people to do that. But the willingness people have to accept this fact, a myth, without any investigation, it's as troubling as it is common, unfortunately. Yep. And I think it, it's funny, the, um, I guess one of the, the biggest associations with all the, the lies is that they wouldn't surrender they they would they would die before they would they would give up but right so one of the thing one of the things i say in the book is that these i think of these lies as pillars that are holding up that bigger lie yeah. which is that they would never surrender and never that they were the greatest warriors ever right and but again when you when you really think about that you think if the spartans do that in every battle how how long would sparta be around for well, right, they would have because that would mean they would have to have a hundred percent casualties every time they lost the battle. Could you imagine that? Yeah. You'd have to lose your entire army every time you lost the battle. Spartan society would be wiped out. You know, it'd, be, it'd be over uh, in, in a week. And we, we even see like when they do have disasters where they do lose uh, a bunch of their peers, it it creates a a shortage within their their, their peer ranks back in Sparta, and then we right. start to see them having to rely more on uh, um, the helots and and uh, non spartiites to, to serve in the, uh, the army. Because of wealth inequality, because they were unwilling to expand the citizenship franchise. Yep. Uh, it really was a society that, that looked, the, the, the impression people have of the Spartans is that there are these warriors living in hard conditions, you know, and the opposite is true. They were aristocratic dandies. They were noblemen who lived pampered, easy lives. Uh, and, uh, they were, think of like medieval knights managing their estates, not having to work um, and sort of doing sports, you know, uh, politicking, breeding horses, going hunting, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but this vision of them as, as these rock hard badasses that, that Frank Miller and Zack Snyder gave is just nonsense. Yep. It's total nonsense. What's, so what's your view on um, the whole Spartan? I, I mean, it's, it comes from... Um... Plutarch again with a whole Spartan upbringing and how sure. people are. So, yeah, the, the general vision. So the agoge, which actually is a later Roman term, the, the term I prefer is Xenophon's pedia, which is means the, the, the education. I think that we know that the Spartans played that up and made it more brutal for the benefit of Roman tourists uh, later on in their, when after Sparta ceased to be a real military power, it was sort of more of a tourist attraction. Um, and the Spart modern Spartans still play up their military greatness to try to sell T-shirts. Uh, you know, go visit Spartan now. You'll see it everywhere. So I can't tell you for a certainty if it was as brutal as Plutarch alleges. I think it was probably less brutal. I think that Plutarch is looking back on the Roman tourist version, right? It certainly fits the time period in which he's writing. We do know that King Agesilaus II was born with a club foot. Um, and he wasn't, by the way, called, right? Which is what we would think would happen if we believe Plutarch. Um, he went through the agoge and he would pass with flying colors. I mean, at least he was one of the top students. Um, so uh, that's at least one point of evidence in favor of maybe not being as brutal as we thought. Um, something else that I always like to point out is that Aristotle, so, so hoplite warfare in ancient Greece was necessarily an amateur affair. Like the idea of a professional soldier is a very modern concept. And it certainly didn't exist almost in any capacity outside mercenaries, and even not really then in ancient Greece. Um, you know, 
they were more like reservists. You were a farmer or a, you know, wheelwright or a philosopher, wherever you were. And, you know, you had your granddad left you a shield and a spear and you kept that, you know, your spear is probably being used to hold up a grapevine or something. And you, you know, the horn would sound in the town square and you'd grab your spear and your helmet and you'd show up and, you know, you'd form in the phalanx, which was deliberately simple. All you had to do was hold your shield up, overlap with the guy next to you. See there in front of you, that's the enemy. The pointy end of your spear goes in that. Don't run away. Like that's the... The whole point was it was designed to be simple so that you wouldn't have to train to be able to be good at it, right? Um, and of course, everyone talks about, well, the Spartans were the only professional army, which is nonsense. They had no sense of professionalism like we would think so. But today, they were certainly more disciplined and organized than the rest of the ancient Greeks. But Aristotle points it out perfectly. He says that the Spartans were not better because they trained hard. They were better because they trained at all. And I, that is a great example, is that when you take the overall incredibly amateur nature of Greek warfare, it is very, very easy to rise above it. And when you have a class of aristocratic dandies that have slaves doing all their work and have nothing but free time, it's a pretty low bar, right? And by the way, we have no evidence of the Spartans training and doing military training. We have evidence of them training in sports, but we don't have them drilling in formation and engaging in mock battles. Yeah. But even that, Training for sports uh, would make them a cut above the average hoplite uh, in the classical world. Yeah, so perhaps maybe the whole the whole legend of it comes from perhaps a formalized education system for the aristocratic class, where perhaps that may have enabled them to become more organized. And then out of that, because obviously we've said already, all the sources are looking in. We don't really have anyone writing that's from within that uh, society. So we're sort of left to right, how other people right, observe. Right. Everybody in, yes, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Yeah, and that, that was one of the interesting points I, I saw come out of your book was the fact that, yes, maybe they were a cut above the others, but it's because they trained somewhat, maybe, whereas everyone else didn't. So you, you're going to have an edge, aren't you? So that's perhaps where right. the, the reputation may have come from. Right, and, and, and what did it do for them? Not much. I mean, like if you look at their if you look at their military history, like they did okay, I guess. You know, like it's not uh, you even that little edge that it gave them from a, a strategic perspective over the life of their military history it didn't give them much of an edge. Mm. And even just the actual face-off battle is only one element of a battle. You've got so many other right. other parts that can right. see success or failure come about. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we've pretty much covered all your, uh, your pillars and give and associate an example with them. But yeah, like everyone should definitely pick up uh, the bronze lie because you've got you find these dispelling all throughout uh, Spartan history. But you also uh, do give them their due when uh, when things are in their favour as well. But um, yeah, and if I could make, if I could make one appeal to your readership, it's it's exactly with that point that we discussed earlier. Please, please, please approach this work with compassion, charity, and curiosity. Uh, you know, there is nothing I want more for these people to be seen in their reality in a sympathetic and uh, a compassionate light. Let's just, more of the golden rule, please. And yeah, absolutely. I, I just finished the last page last night. You read the entire book and that's what comes through. It's not trying to demigrate the Spartans. It's basically trying to look at them on their own terms, what really happened, and try and understand them as a people and understand that they are the same as everyone else. They have the same failings, the same, the same um, successes. So yeah, I, I definitely recommend if you're going to, you need to read the whole book to get the whole, the whole concept and the idea to really fully form as well. Well, thank but, you. It's, it's extremely gratifying that that's the impression you got because yeah. this is exactly what I'm going for. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. But I thought to finish things off, it's um, sure. 2,500 years since the, well, I think it's almost nearly exactly if you go on the later date um, of the Battle of Thermopylae. And uh, I thought we could finish with that since it's probably one of the most well-known battles. And I think we <laughs> can find a lot of uh, Spartan stereotypes uh, mixed throughout. So perhaps could you yeah. maybe just highlight some of the lies that uh, are present throughout the, the accounts of the battle? Yeah, happy to. So the Battle of Thermopylae, I think, is really where the legend, this bronze lie begins. Um, uh, and I, I think it begins here because, make no mistake, what people, most people think of about the Battle of Thermopylae is just wrong. Um, the, the general myth is that Xerxes of Persia 
came over into Greece with an army of millions and 300 brave Spartans alone, this is the story that Frank Miller and Zach Snyder would have you believe, held this tiny little pass, you know, all muscular white men against this brown skin horde. So you can see the right wing anti-immigrant fodder that's uh, being used in this, in this um, falsity. Uh, and it was a fated suicide mission. An oracle from Delphi said that a king, a Spartan king must give his life or Greece would no longer be free. And they, they fought to the last man and their defeat was as glorious as a victory. And it, I don't know what it did. It demoralized the Persians so much that they went on to be defeated later. And, you know, it's just like hot buttered BS. Like it's all false. Um, it wasn't just 300 Spartans. It was a thousand Spartans when you count uh, the Perioikoi. The Perioikoi were these non-citizen artisans who also fought as hoplites, second-class citizens alongside the Spartiata. And that doesn't even count their helot slaves uh, who would have come and fought as light infantry. It was a coalition of 7,000 Greeks, not just Spartans. And uh, when you consider the actual terrain at Thermopylae, uh, it is, that is more than enough people to keep that held and, and, and expect to hold against an army of any size, especially when the massive fleet uh, of the Hellenic coalition was holding off the coast. Xerxes' army was nowhere near a million. It was probably closer to 100,000, but that's still big enough that the strategic goal is obvious. We can't beat them in a stand-up fight, but if we hold them here long enough, they will starve. Because you have to remember that ancient armies live on forage. Um, and they, if they're held in one place for long, too long, especially in hostile country, they're going to run out of food. There's going to be desertion. There's going to be disease. So it is very, very clear that the Hellenic coalition's goal was we hold them. And by the way, Thermopylae isn't even its own battle. It's one of two battles, the Battle of Artemisia, the naval battle that was probably more important against the Persian fleet. These two synonymous battles were going on. So right away, we have a BS about a suicide mission, uh, a BS about the numbers, BS about the objective. None of that uh, is true. We also know that um, Leonidas from Herodotus was expecting to be relieved. He was expecting additional troops to come Herodotus says. So what actually happened? He did not expect, they did not expect to be a suicide. They expected to hold the Persians there until they were starved out. Um, then there's this myth of Ephialtes, this hunchback traitor, traitor Spartan, according to Zack Snyder and Frank Miller, who shows a secret goat path around the Spartan position so that the Persian army is able to flank them. Come on. You have to remember that Persia was the most sophisticated and advanced empire in the world at its time. Although I, I want to caveat that statement that um, scholars of China may disagree. Uh, inarguably, it was one of the most, right? And it had one of the most sophisticated intelligence reconnaissance networks in the world. Do you honestly think that they did not know about that goat path months before they, of course not. They had hired local guides. Ephialtes wasn't one person. He was probably a hundred people, Malian shepherds that lived there, that knew the ground backwards and forwards. They absolutely knew that path. And Leonidas wasn't stupid either. He knew that that path was there. He would have done reconnaissance. But he had the experience of the Battle of Marathon just 10 years earlier, where every Greek had been equal to 10 Persians. And so it was, it was reasonable for him to think, well, if I put a thousand Phokians on that path, they'll be able to hold it. And I won't give away the farm because Michael Livingston and I have done um, some additional research that we hope to publish in a later book about additional fail-safe fallback positions that Leonidas had planned that are um, specific to Mount Calidromo and the routes through it, of which there are many, and we've mapped them and walked them many times. We were actually supposed to be in Greece just a few weeks ago, but unfortunately the fires um, made the Greek government um, pass some laws. They don't want people off trail, you know, in the woods. Yeah. And rightly so. So we've had to delay our trip, but we'll be going back there and do research hopefully soon. Um, and these Phokians that were sent to guard the path, Herodotus has them fleeing to a high point. And then the Persian army just goes around them, right? Leaving a thousand guys behind you on high ground. That's a smart tactical move. The problem with so much of Herodotus's narrative, which Zach uh, Snyder and Frank Miller take at face value, is it in order to believe it, you have to believe that both the Persians and the Greeks were stupid. <laughs> and they weren't, right? Like that's, they, were, they were obviously competent military commanders. So what happened, of course, is that the Phokians actually had a stand-up fight with the Persians with every belief that they would hold that goat track. And they didn't. They lost. And that uh, Leonidas's other fail-safes, which I won't 
give away the farm, um, failed. And he found himself now having to fight on two, in two directions. So this narrow pass that he was holding and this wall that he was defending, the Fokian wall that he rebuilt and held, was no longer tenable. Um, and that is when you get your suicide moment, where he retreats to the Colonos, this hill, and has this last stand where, uh, you know, we will fight in the shade and they are cut down in this dramatic scene in the end of 300. That much is probably true. And we know this because uh, a Greek archaeologist, Spiridon Marinatis, excavated the Colonos, this hill, um, and found many Persian arrowheads and some javelin heads as well. Marinatos comes in for a lot of criticism. And I, I do believe that a lot of that criticism is that Marinatos was close with the, the, re, the regime of the colonels, this right-wing junta that ruled Greece. And uh, so people are very uncomfortable with his work, um, but it, it's pretty hard to argue that fine, right? Yeah. Right on that hill. Yeah. Um, so we do have good reason to believe that is the hill where the, this last stand occurred. Um, and of course, I'm greatly condensing in the interest of time, um, but uh, there's a lot more to this. But the bottom line is that the Greeks had every expectation, the Greeks, not just the Spartans, had every expectation of holding that pass and winning. They lost, and they lost because they were outgeneraled, not because of any other, not because of treachery. They lost because they were outgeneraled. And the defeat was so demoralizing and so huge because they, they, they were there to hold the Persians long enough to make them start, and they delayed them for three days. Xerxes went on to burn Athens. Like, it was just a disaster. Tom Holland, who wrote an amazing book called Persian Fire, he's written a lot of great, this is not the actor who played Spider-Man, nice. this is the amazing nice. story. Um, well, I mean, and it's funny, I, on Twitter, in one of my most embarrassing moments, I tried to tease him about it, and he didn't respond to me, and I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, he must get this joke <laughs> every day, that was not a good move, Mike. So, I mean, he's very gracious, but uh, Persian Fire is an amazing book, all of your listeners should read it. It's the kind of history I aspire to write, uh, both firmly grounded in scholarship and, and gripping like a novel. Yep. Uh, but he theorizes in another article that Themistocles, the famous Athenian, saw this defeat of the Hellenic coalition was like, oh my God, all of Greece is about to surrender to Persia. And so he, he was a master spin doctor. So he spun this BS story about the defense of Thermopylae being this fated last stand of the Spartans. And from that kernel, this whole toxic myth was grown. Um, Holland doesn't have a ton of support for that position, but man, does it ring true. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing on uh, Tom's book too, is that's it's probably one of the, just a, for a general view on the Greek and Persian wars, it's one I've recommended many times just because it's so accessible, uh, it's entertaining. And I think if someone's going to get into Greek history, that's the book to really draw you in to then want you to know more as well. And, and Holland's, by the way, if, if any of your readers would like to read a primary source in translation, Tom Holland's translation of Herodotus with a, with a foreword by Paul Cartledge, who is a very, oh, there we are, he's holding it up for your viewers, right? So it, it, it is, in my opinion, uh, the, the best annotation, the best forward, uh, and the best translation for a, a general audience of the work I've yet read. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really think you can't go wrong with it and highly recommend it to your readers, uh, your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Another point you made too um, about Herodotus um, and his sort of view on, on events. I found he's very good at like giving the accounts of the stories that he's been passed, that have been passed on to him or what he's, he's learned. But one thing I've found is, I guess a lot of writers too, they don't have the... A, Strategic, uh, strategic concept in their head of what's actually really happening to make those connections between, I mean, and another thing you bring up is especially an interesting point you made too in the book was where you have the fleet that rounded uh, Euboea to try and trap the uh, the, the, right. the Greeks in the, right. in the straits there and how right. perhaps that was actually yeah, an outflanking move to get to uh, Thermopylae. Yeah, I mean, it was, it absolutely was. Uh, I mean, why else would they have been doing it? I mean, there's the argument that they were there to trap the Greek fleet, to attack the Greek fleet from behind, which is Herodotus's narrative. Um, but you're telling me you're going to sail through the Gulf of Malus, right past the land army. You have this many troops and this many ships, and you're not going to discharge Marines in their backfield? You know, like, are you, are you an idiot? Like, that would never happen. You know, this is the thing. Like, you don't become the king of Persia. And you don't have this incredible command staff and, and miss opportunities like this. Like you look, people make mistakes all the time, even boneheaded moves. But your assumption should never be 
that the commander of either army when you're studying military history is a fool. Like that should not be your assumption. Your assumption should be that they're competent unless you have evidence to the contrary. And we have plenty of evidence that Xerxes was competent. Xerxes was competent merely by his ability to stay in power uh, through many rebellions. Yes. Um, so I just, of course, that was what the plan was. Of course it was. And it would have gone, happened too if it hadn't been for that storm. One other point of Herodotus I'd like to make to your listeners. If Herodotus is guilty of one thing, it is perpetuating a, 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 maybe even initiating a false East versus West narrative. This idea of an existential struggle between Eastern Persians and Western Greeks, between Europe and Asia, which persists to this day and which is eagerly digested by Frank Miller, by Zack Snyder, and by the right-wing ideologues who I pose in this book. It is an incredibly damaging and false impression of um, ancient cultures in the Mediterranean basin. The, proof, the truth is that the Greeks and the Persians had more in common with each other than they had um, that made them divergent. And, that's, and that there were many zinnia, these guest friendships and, and deep bonds of, of uh, loyalty and connection between these two peoples. Certainly there were cultural differences and religious and linguistic differences, but there was also a great deal that united them. And this idea that, uh, I've said this before, it's less of a, um, existential struggle, struggle between two opposing cultures and more of a family spat. Yep. Uh, and it's really important to see it that way. Uh, and unfortunately, we've adopted that vision uh, in the modern world, and it's really destructive. And, and it really is something that Herodotus laid the foundations for and something that I really hope to oppose, not just in this work, but in, in all of my future work. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, a very good note to sort of uh, end on there too. But um... Thanks, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on, uh, Mike, to talk about uh, your book, uh, The Bronze Lie. Um, I recommend definitely go, everyone go pick it up. It's very accessible. Um, it surveys through the you know the entire sort of military history of Sparta, and you probably get a, a better view of what was really happening. Um, and you do a great job outlining perhaps what was happening, um, what may have really been going on. But you're also, you know, you come forward and say, I have no proof of this, but just from my experiences, I think this is what was really happening. Um, yep. When I, when I don't yeah. know something, I absolutely say. And uh, I, that's definitely throughout the book. So there's no, I don't feel like there's, there's no agenda here. Like everything is laid out on the plate too. So I'm, I think it was uh, very well written anyway. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Look, I won't lie to you. Anytime any author publishes a book, their heart is in their throat. You know, they're terrified of how people are going to receive it. This is my most ambitious work. Uh, and I, I won't lie, like I'm terrified about the reception. So it's anytime somebody gets what I was trying to do, it's really gratifying. Thank you for saying That's that. That's good. Um, so where can everyone find you if they want to follow you on social media or? or... Sure. So I, I, I answer all my email. You, you can you can send me hate mail. I get plenty of it. <laughs> um, I'm at, uh, so my name is easy to remember, Mike Cole, M-Y-K-E-C-O-L-E. I'm on Twitter at, at Mike Cole, uh, on Instagram at Mike underscore Cole, facebook.com forward slash Mike Cole, and my email is Mike at Mike Cole.com, my website, Mike Cole.com. Feel free to reach out to me through any channels if you have questions. Uh, I don't get so much fan mail that I don't have time to answer at all. So uh, you will definitely hear back from me if you uh, shoot me a line. And uh, thanks so much for uh, having me on. And uh, thank you to your listeners for listening to me and your willingness to check out my work. No worries. Yeah, and everyone else will put all those links up on uh, the episode page and also have links to uh, Mike's uh, book, uh, Bronze Lie, and also put up uh, uh, Phalanx versus Legion as well. Um, but you. yeah, thanks for coming on and, uh, and uh, talking about your latest book. Great. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you too, Mark. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed the talk with Mike Cole and I hope you got a better understanding of what the bronze lie is all about. I think Mike really put forward his motivations and what he was trying to achieve with this book. I think he also gave us a good understanding of where these bronze lies are at work in illustrating a few examples associated with the various pillars. Though, it must be noted, this was just a snapshot of the lies at work. You can find many more examples all throughout the book and throughout Spartan history. I would highly recommend picking up a copy of the bronze lie to investigate these pillars even further. Remember, if you are in the US, UK or Canada, you can go into the draw to win a copy of Mike's books, The Bronze Lie and Legion vs Phalanx, courtesy of Osprey Publishing. All you need to do is be following Casting Through Ancient Greece on Facebook or Twitter. If you're on Twitter, retweet and like the episode post. Or if you're on Facebook, share and like the episode post. Two lucky winners will be drawn on the 8th of October and notified by message on social media. Their results will also be posted up on Facebook and Twitter. So good luck everyone, and let's spread the word.
Thank you everyone for your continued support, and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. If you have found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series, and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece, or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. Next episode, I'll be getting back to part two of our look on Sicily, where we'll be exploring the Greek periphery. So I look forward to seeing you for episode 39, Sicily, Conflict and Tyrants.